Beautiful. Let's stand and hear God's word, John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Jesus is getting ready. He knows his crucifixion is coming, so he's talking to his disciples about staying connected to him even after his death and resurrection. Jesus says to them, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Staying connected, abiding in the vine. We don't use the word abide very much. Um, We would use the word connected. Like I said earlier, like connecting a power takeoff on a tractor, you've got to have that power takeoff, those hoses and things connected. You've got to have the, the shaft connected or it's not going to do any good. All the power on the tractor will never get uh, to the implement behind it. Same way today in technology, connected with Wi-Fi. If you're connected to the Wi-Fi Internet, you can resource things on the Internet. If you're not connected, no information. We know what it is to be connected. Jesus is telling his disciples Be connected to me. I'm the only source. I'm the vine. We don't grow many grapes here in Adair County. I've not seen very many grape trellises and things like that, a few. But grapes grow from one vine, one vine about like that, comes out of the ground, and then usually the grapes are are trellised up high. If you cut that one vine, all the grapes will die. All the leaves and branches will die. Jesus is telling his disciples, I am your source, I am your supply, I am your spiritual life through me. So they get it. They all understand that. In Israel, they raised a lot of grapes. They made wine. They understood Jesus is the vine. They are the branches. Here we are 2,000 years later, and the branches are still continuing. Every one of you is a branch. Trinity Congregation is a branch of the big body of Christ. And we are creating more people to be more branches and more branches. Let me tell you a little story about a maple tree in my backyard. Behind the parsonage is a beautiful maple tree. Last year, over the years, ivy has grown up into that tree got bigger and bigger until you saw probably one-third ivy leaves and two-thirds maple leaves, and the ivy began to take over the maple. I don't mind ivy, but I like maple better, and I like maple leaves turning red in the fall much better, so I decided I'm going to get rid of the ivy. And how do you get rid of the ivy? Do you climb up and pull it all out? You could. Or you go to the trunk of the tree And there comes the stem right down to the root. All you do is clip that stem, and the whole thing dies. A year later, I looked out with joy. I looked out at that tree, lots and lots of maple leaves and lots of little shriveled brown ivy leaves. They died. Same way with us. If we're connected to the vine, we live and we're green and we're fruitful and we're planted by the water and we'll bear fruit in our season wonderfully. But if we're cut off from Christ, there's no good fruit. There's no good work. Oh, we do work, but it's not God's work. It doesn't have spiritual power. It doesn't have spiritual purpose. 
in Jesus Christ. Again, Paul says we're created for good works. Those good works are lined up by God. When we do them in obedience to God, there is power, there's purpose, and there's joy. There's joy. We've got to stay connected. All right. Um, simple three reasons to do good works. Uh, Karen and I saw a sign over in Greene County. Friday we went over to Greene County to try out a lumber yard. We're so excited about building a house that we wanted to look at lumber. We just wanted to touch it and smell it. No, not really. I had to buy some stuff for the cabin. A couple of you have noticed that I'm on vacation this week. Well, kind of. Her Majesty has many royal edicts for me. To fix the small royal palace so that no unroyal lizards and bugs can get in. So I have a little cabin repair. So we went to buy lumber over in Greene County. On the way back, on the left, up on a rock quarry or rock side, is this sign just hand-painted, trust God and do good. Ah, well said. Trust God and do good. That's the sermon. Faith, we're saved by faith, and then we do good works. This lines up perfectly with Paul's scripture and his teaching in Ephesians 2. That was last week. Uh, Clint, if you can find the slide of last week's sermon summary. Last week we learned, must we do good works to be saved? No, no. We cannot earn our salvation. Absolutely not. The gift is grace. The gate is faith. We're saved by grace through faith in what Jesus did. And the glory is the glory of the works. And who gets the glory? God. God gets the glory for the works. We'll come back to that. What are these, what's the difference between works and good works? Works are things done on your own. You can go do anything you want. God gave you a free will. You live in a free country. You can do what you choose to do. That's good and that's bad. Free will was one of the most dangerous things God gave us. Works done on our own, we do them, we earn, we work, we do, but it has no spiritual power and no heavenly reward. Good works are those done in response to God's direction. Good works line up with His will. There's a difference. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, my presence, my direction, what you do is worthless. Paul would later call them rubbish. Isaiah calls them filthy rags. Nothing. And some of these themes we've pulled out of our Father's Day sermon, we've pulled out of last week's sermon, and now we're going forward. And before I go into the three reasons to do good works, let me just say that good works are done. Clint, I think I got a slide for this. Good works are done under the direction of God, in the supply of God, and in the timing of God. Under the direction of God, in the supply of God, and the timing of God. Our Father knows. He knows what works. He knows what to do. He knows when to do it. He knows. Are we required to do good works? Do we have to do good works? Oh, please don't be so selfish. Don't even ask that question because you've given away your selfishness. Christ has paid terribly to pay for our lousy sins. Oh, but I don't want to do any good works for you, Jesus. I just want the salvation and I want to do my own thing. That is so selfish. Can't you see now you're on His saving team? You're in the body of Christ. He saved you, and now we work to save others. As Karen and I, last week, the the excavation team dug out the whole basement, dug it out from the dirt to the loose rock to the hard rock. They hammered rock. They cleared out a whole walkout back. We are so excited we can't stand it. We had to drive down in it the other day. We just had to see it and feel it. We're learning all kinds of things. But in that, in that midst of that, I tell them God showed us his property. God has lined this up. And while, while two guys were working, one guy was just kind of there watching, getting ready for the next day. So I hung out and talked to him for a while. 
And I eventually asked him, you know, uh, you baptized? No. Oh, you don't go to church anywhere? My kids do. Oh, you got, how old are your kids, he told me. Oh, well, we got vacation Bible school coming. Could I invite them to come? Sure. Could I have your cell number? Sure. So I have his cell number. I'm going to invite them to vacation Bible school. Uh, we're on the saving team. We, we don't save people, but at least we offer. Okay, number one, point number one. Patty, you don't have this one yet because you already came with number three. Point number one is reasons to do good works. Number one, folks are helped. Folks are helped. Think of who helped you last week. Who helped you? What cooks? What cashiers? What doctors? What farmers? What emergency response people? Daryl Harris was, was helped by EMS people that came and picked him up in the ambulance, took him to the hospital, then took him to Glasgow. He was helped by a competent surgeon and a surgical team and nurses and nurses' aides and his wife. Helped. Yes, Daryl climbed up a ladder, tried to trim a limb off and fell off a ladder. Claudette said, please don't do that when I'm gone. Well, he did. I told Allie and Aaron that. You know what Allie said? Sometimes they just don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> knowing Mr. Calvin has often got on wagons and fallen off and doesn't listen to his wife either. I'm trying to listen to my wife. Jackson, you've got to listen to your wife. Clint, you've got to listen to your wife. They're helpful most of the time. Um, sometimes they just don't understand, but most of the time. Speaking to Mr. Calvin at the nursing home, I went by Thursday night. Annette texted me Thursday. She said, Dad is not doing good. And we expected it, but we didn't expect it this quickly. So I went over Thursday night to see him. And I forgot he goes to bed at 6 o'clock. They have told me that since I've been here. But I was there at 6.30. He was sound asleep. But the aide who, who took me to his room was a sweetheart. Just very polite, very helpful, uh, and she stayed with me. She told me about Mr. Calvin's coming out to the dining room and how he would talk about the Lord. He would share. Uh, she told me of his good works. Folks are helped. That nurse's aide was helped by Mr. Calvin. I was helped by her. I was there to help him. Helping helping. What if we did not help each other? What if we did not help each other? Food wouldn't get cooked. Diseases wouldn't get healed. Work wouldn't get done. It'd be a terrible world wouldn't help each other. Um, if we don't help each other, if we don't help, someone will go without. Someone will be left out and you will have lost out. Good works make a difference. They make a difference. Let me go deeper than just the good works. Good works are not do done simply to help other people. They are often done to free other people. Romans 12, 21. Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, meaning with good works. You mean there's a battle between good and evil? Yes. Evil would just as soon take over the whole world and take us all to hell. That's Satan's will. Jesus came to bring the Father's will, that we would be saved and have an eternal life in heaven. Romans 12, 21, the New Living Translation says, Do not let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Good actually dispels evil, pushes it. Jesus pushes it out. It's attributed to Edmund Burke, this quote. It says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Evil will take over if you do nothing. Good men, good women doing good work. As a matter of fact, this quote is so heavily used, 67% of people voted the number one quoted quote. Our culture gets it. If we don't do good, evil will take over. Okay, point two. After folks are helped, number two, faith is proven. Faith is proven. Now, Jackson, this is where I wanted to know your wedding day. 
August 13th last year, you professed your vows to your wife, Meredith, and she in turn professed her faithfulness to you. After you, after you took the vows, you were married. You were married the moment you said, till death do us part. Bam, you're married. Then you did rings, then you did other things, fine. But you were married at the vows. I always tell you that. Clinton, Julie, I told you that at the vows. After the vows, do you have to do any more good works for each other? Hey, we're married. That's all I have to do. Jackson hasn't done a thing for Meredith in 10 months. We have a serious counseling session coming up. Uh, no, after marriage vows are shared, then you continue doing good works. Clinton, Julie, it's been a week. Are y'all, have you done anything for each other? Or you just, no, we're married. That's it. I'm done. No. It just began. The moment you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, it began. He gave you the gift of grace and forgiveness. He gave you a new heart and a new life. But the relationship just began. We do good works for each other. Jackson, I told you, my wife has a list of good works for me to do this week. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with your wife speaking the will of God to you. That's part of it. Clint, we're to give our lives to Christ as Christ gave himself to the church. And then wives, you're supposed to be very sweet if we're really working hard. All right, please be sweet. Going deeper, faith is proven by works. We prove our marriage vows by our works. More so, we prove our Christian vows by our works. We prove them. They don't save us, but they prove us. Karen and I are meeting more people, not just the person I met on the job site who I'm inviting to Bible school. We are meeting contractors and people who are proving to us they know what they're doing. We're seeing things happen. They know what, what, what's going on. They're proving to us what they say they can do. Now, but I will say to you, I talked to one contractor, and he told me, now there's a guy in Campbellsville. You don't want him. He only gets it right one out of ten times. I said, thank you. I don't want him. He didn't tell me a name. It wasn't gossip. I don't have no idea who he's talking about. He also said, there's another contractor, um, you don't have him, do you? I hired him to do an electric job for me. I paid him the full amount. He did half the job and left with the money. I said, no, he's not my contractor, but he won't be either. You see, bad works follow you also. Nobody's perfect, but we know to keep our word. We know that God, if we're a Christian God, they're looking at God too. Anyway, I have to move on. Faith is proven. Thirdly, Patty, this is your point. The Father is glorified. President Trump glorified God the Father by naming him on national television. That's why we do these good works. Now, you heard this scripture two weeks ago, John 15, 8, in the Father's Day sermon. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. Bearing the fruit glorifies God. Is there really a God? Let me show you. Let me prove it to you. Uh, I'll close with this. Joyce Piles, when she was six weeks old, was taken to St. Louis. Now, we have some St. Louis residents among us, Roy and Pam. I'm going to ask you a very, very important St. Louis question in a moment, so be ready. It's actually a Missouri question, so get ready. You'll know the answer, don't worry. Uh, Nellie and Joyce went to St. Louis years ago and could, because Nellie's husband was in the military. He was a medic. He served in the hospital in St. Louis. She moved there, took the train there, never been out of Adair County, went there. And Missouri has a slogan. What is your all slogan? What's on your license plate? That's it. The show me, you had some help from over here. <laughs> we welcome help. The, the people are helped. That's great. The show me state. Show me the Father. Thomas said, uh, we, show us the Father. Well, where? where? And God, we don't know where you're going. Show us. When we do good works according to God's will, we show it. And people feel it. They may not actually say it, but they can tell. They know it. So three reasons. There are more reasons to do good works, but folks are helped. Faith is proven and the Father is glorified. 
and we're going to spend a moment in Holy Communion right now. Um, although, I, uh, let me, just give me two more minutes, because I want to tell you something that Justice Joseph Story said about the New Testament back in 1844. Supreme Court Justice wrote this, where can the purest principles, Clint, it's the second quote on Joseph Story, where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? Where are benevolence, the love of truth, sobriety, and industry so powerful and irresistibly inculcated as in the sacred volume? A Supreme Court justice says the New Testament is the source of morality. And I can't quit yet. I've got to tell you a story on Kentucky because I wasn't in Kentucky yet, but I'm proud of Kentucky. Kentucky had a statute that the Kentucky school system stated that every classroom in Kentucky is to post the Ten Commandments. Every classroom, from preschool to seniors in high school. So they were. The Ten Commandments were in every school and every classroom in Kentucky. In 1980, a lawsuit was brought against Kentucky, against the, the state su the superintendent of our state school system, Mr. Graham. A Mr. Stone brought the lawsuit, saying, you cannot put the Ten Commandments in a public classroom. We always have. In that time, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mr. Stone. No, you cannot put those Ten Commandments in a secular educational institution. So we had to take down the Ten Commandments in every classroom. Wes, I haven't inspected all the classrooms. I don't know if everybody did, but we were commanded by the, the Supreme Court to take them down. Kentucky was glorifying God by posting His Word in the classroom. No apologies, no excuses, there it is. Had to take it down. So what do we do now? The Gideons were led to create a new resource that could go to the youth. I've already told Wes in the earlier service, I think we need to create t-shirts, we have some already, that have the Ten Commandments or have the Two Great Commandments or have the Great Commission on them real big where you can read them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. People ask, why are you wearing that? Wear it on your back, you've got more room. You can't tell me not to wear the Word of God. I can wear what I want to school. Now, Betty, I have to tell a story that your daughter told on you. Someone wore an indecent T-shirt to Lindsay Wilson College. Betty Brown did not like it, and she told the dean of students, mm, that T-shirt is not appropriate. You never saw that T-shirt again, did you? <laughs> Gone. Gone. That, and I need to close. I know I need to close, but I'm very proud that we will still glorify our Father in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ with our, with our deeds, our words, our clothes, whatever, however we can, so someone can come before the Lord. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, this closes our message, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father 